Hola, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hola, Amsterdam. Jude Morgen. Yeah, did I say it right? Thank you for being here. That's, that's as much Dutch I have as <laughs> that I have for you today. Hola, that's in Spanish. Uh, uh, you, by the way, you, you woke up early, and uh, you, you know how hard that is? I mean, you, you have so many distractions. You have uh, uh, Netflix, you have uh, online shopping, you have the, uh, the Red Dress District, and uh, <laughs> you have uh, also a beautiful city, so, uh, uh, but you're here and, and to watch me. So uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Danke, for being here. So uh, whenever I give talks or workshops, I do them, uh, I usually give like a practical, useful, uh, actionable stuff and hard skills. And I think there's a lot of value in uh, feeling like you have a new tool that you can use and like create something after that. Well, today I'm going to do something totally different and, 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 act like, and actually the opposite of that. And <laughs> hopefully you're not disappointed uh, because I'm going to be talking about some touchy feely stuff and I'm going to be a bit vulnerable. And before you raise your pitchforks, I think you might still get something useful at the end of this. So, uh, but mostly, this is just going to be me reacting, reflecting on a personal moment and trying to make sense of it on how that might have affected who I currently am as a creative and hopefully invite you to do the same. So we're going to do this with some story time. And I don't know, have you ever been in like, in the shower, relaxing under the hot water, singing, feeling like everything is perfect, or probably when you are just about to fall asleep and you're just drifting away, and then suddenly, boom, a memory that you had hidden deeply in your subconscious just comes back and it just hits you and you shudder and you're ashamed and a little bit scared probably, and you just cringe so bad remembering that one moment in your life when you did something that was extra stupid and a memory that you are really embarrassed of and you had just hidden away, never to come back. Well, uh, like three years ago, while in the shower, one of these memories came back to me and, and I want to share it with you. Um, so I think a lot of us had a personal hero when we were kids, when we were growing up. Someone we just looked up to and we thought they were just the most exceptional people. Well, for me, that was my uncle, Alfredo, or Tio Felo, as I would dearly call him. And I thought my uncle was just the coolest dude in the world. And he was young, but older than me. He was tall, had great hair, big smile. He was just good looking. And he had this charm and charisma that could just melt anyone. And my uncle is from Texas, so, but for some time he lived in San Diego and he was a US Navy sailor and he was stationed there in San Diego. So San Diego is only like two hours away from my hometown in Mexicali. So once a month, he would get a free weekend and from his service and he would come to visit my family, my home in Mexicali. So he used to wear this crisp, all-white sailor uniform with the Dixie cup and the neckerchief. And for me, that was just the dopest look ever. And he once gave me one of his hats. <laughs> and I would never, ever take it off. I, I would play basketball with it. I would wear it to school. I would go to the be beach with it. Uh, and that thing got so dirty then stained with sweat, but I didn't care. I thought I looked as cool as my uncle wearing that stupid hat. Well, now, back in those times, I'm talking about a long time ago, there was no Spotify, no iPods, no MP3s, no Discover Weekly playlist. And back then we had this thing called mixtapes. And let me do an explanation uh, for some of the mil millennials here. Uh, these mixtapes were a compilation of songs recorded on cassette tapes. 
and you have to physically record a song to a tape from another tape or probably from the radio. And creating a mixtape required a lot, a lot of dedication and thought. And you had to think about the order of the songs, uh, create a theme, a ride, an experience. And you had to be very careful with the, your choices because there was a lot of labor involved. Maybe you have seen some, uh, how some old stereos will have two cassette players. And you could hit play in one of the cassettes and record on the other. And you had to sit through the entire song while it plays to be able to record it from one cassette to the other. And there was no drag and drop. No, no drag and drop interactions, no MP3 folders. Once you recorded a song, that was it. Unless you were willing to rewind, find that moment when the previous song ends and record on top of the old song and probably lose some quality and do it all over again. Making a mixtape was an art form. Well, my uncle was the master, master of mixtapes. And he always carried with him a huge box of cassettes, and it was his most precious possession. For me, it was a gold mine of influence. See, back then, I was a confused and lost 10-year-old boy who was desperate to find a purpose and identity. Well, now I'm still a 37-year-old who is still desperate to find a purpose and identity, uh, but back then I was too. <laughs> And my uncle, with his swagger and his music, was my only source of influence. And he was just my ticket to becoming cool. So whenever he would come to visit us, I would just like dive deep into this box. I would try to listen to his music as much as I could. I would just like blast his jams on the stereo. And see, something I didn't mention about the art of mixtapes was the documentation of the songs. You had to write the name of the artist and song to be able to know what the hell you were listening to. You also have to give it a name of your mixtapes if you wanted to. There was a new wave mix, the rock mix, the chill mix, the new wave volume two mix, because we, we had like chapters and, and, and volumes and stuff like that. So my uncle was just very meticulous about the writing of his mixtapes. He would take notes on these rule books, uh, booklets, and he would usually uh, come with cassettes. Uh, like, cassettes have, had these booklets. So on side A, you would just like a list with all the tracks on each line, and then on side B, just do the same thing. He would write the number, the song name, and artists with just perfect penmanship. So I would just devour these booklets. They were my Bible. And I would try to learn and memorize everything I was listening to. The more bands I knew, the cooler I would become. They were like a coolness currency. And see, regarding these, uh, reading these booklets and listening could be a challenge because back then there was no digital display Tell me exactly what song I was listening to and how long it will, uh, the song will end. And you had to pay a lot of attention to match the song to the booklet. Uh, we complain, by the way, about songs that have just this repetitive chorus, uh, but they are actually super helpful when you are trying to realize what the hell you're listening to because uh, usually these repetitive chorus are the name of the actual song. So you're listening to that and you're like, oh, okay, it's this song, I'm back on track. So every weekend that my uncle come visit us, I would try to learn as much as I could because my uncle will take his box with him and he will leave and I will not see him until one month later. So one time after my uncle had left, my mom took me to the downtown market in Mexicali. In these outdoor markets, you could find a little bit of uh, everything. And you like toys of luchadores, dresses from Oaxaca, spicy candy, mariachi hats, grasshopper and ant tacos. We have those over there. And some shops would sell bootleg albums, like pirated records. So I would search for a record from one of the artists my uncle liked, because I, whatever I could remember, I would try to find the name of the band that I memorized. But to be honest, these shops would usually never carry any of that kind of music. It was just mostly Mexican artists and banda and mariachi and nothing cool as what my uncle listened to. So my searches 
were usually pointless until this one time when I found a record that captured my attention. <laughs> and it had a cover <laughs> with a giant number two and a letter U painted with a bold typeface. It said, to you, to unlimited. And it had the picture of these two badasses and a woman and a, me and a man just being cool as shit. And it hit me. I remember this. I remember seeing this name in one of the booklets from one of my uncle's mixtapes. So I say to my mom, mom, you have to buy this for me. She did, and so we get in the car, and I put that bad boy in the stereo, and boom, it's this loud, hardcore, uh, Eurodance, techno, 90s song. Maybe you heard it, and it goes like, Get ready for this. So I was like, wow, all month, all month, I would just listen to this crap nonstop. I would just put on my Walkman and just like, get ready for this. I would just like, gotta walk to the groceries. No problem, get ready for this. Gotta do my homework. Hell yeah, get ready for this. Gotta do my chores. I'm down, get ready for this. So even my mom liked it. She would just like do her workouts to the music. Probably that was just a signal for me that probably uh, something was wrong. And I would be by her side and exercise with her and just like, get ready for this. And I thought, this is it. I'm cool. I'm just as cool as my uncle. And I was doing the lamest things a kid would have to do, but it didn't matter because I was listening to a band that my uncle liked and it was my record. By the way, this was a full album, so there were like 12 songs of this stuff, and I listened to this all month on repeat in anticipation for when my uncle would come back. So see, in my mind, I had this fantasy. My uncle would get home, then he would go to my room, and he would see this cassette and ask, whoa, who owns this record? Who listens to Two Unlimited? And I would be like, oh yeah. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> and he would say, wow, Pablo, you're the coolest dude ever. I'm so proud to have you as my nephew. Let's listen to this record all weekend together. And the two of us would just be raging to it. Da -da 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 -da. That was my fantasy. Well, it's the end of the month and my uncle is arriving soon. So I prepared my plan. My uncle arrives. He sees the cassette, question mark, success. And here's one thing, when my uncle visited, he would stay in my room. He would take my bed and I would, list, I would just sleep on, on, on the floor. So I sneakily put the cassette on the bed so he would find it. Yet, I didn't want to be too obvious about it. I just wanted it to be casually laying there. Even then, I understood that to be cool, you gotta look like you're not trying. So my uncle arrives and he goes to my room and he's tired after the trip. So he lays in bed and he just turns the TV on. And he totally misses the cassette. And I was like, crap, gotta put it closer to him. So I would just carefully move the album, <laughs> just slowly slide it to his side and I wanted, I wanted him to find it accidentally. But even after this stealthy move, he was missing it. He was just too distracted, just watching the TV. So I said, you know what? I have to take matters into my own hands. And I grabbed the cassette and I showed it to my uncle and said, hey, Tio, look at the record I got. <laughs> and he grabbed it and he looked at it. He was confused and just said, what, what is this? And I was like, I jumped, it's, it's too unlimited. You know that band that you like. It's too you, too unlimited. He was still confused and I said, yeah, you know, you, you have it in one of your mixtapes. It's to you, too unlimited. And he looked at it carefully and then it hit him. <laughs> I saw this spark in his eyes and then he started laughing. <laughs> 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 Not to you, 
You too. <laughs> Not this crap. I like you too. Who listens to this? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and it felt... <laughs> and it felt so small. My heart was broken. Ha, ha, you like this crap? Dude, this music is not cool. And I tried to play it cool, you know. Pff, yeah, totally. This music is crap. Oh, only losers listen to this. Oh. But, and he kept laughing and watching TV. And I was just by his side. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting, stoic, watching the TV, playing it cool, you know. But I was seriously dead inside. I was so humiliated. But of course, I wouldn't show it. That moment was put in the vault. Push those feelings deep inside me, never to be remembered, you know? And I know this sounds like nothing, and I, I know it's just a band or whatever, but for this little kid, that was everything. His hero just thought that he was lame. And after that, I got so mad at myself. I felt so ashamed and stupid. Why did I put out myself up to that? I was obviously not cool. Who, I was, who was I trying to fool? I, I was a fake. Oops, sorry. <laughs> then I started feeling resentful towards everyone and everything around me. I swore I would never try to seek other people's approval. I was going to do my own thing, and I will not care if you like it or not. After that, oops, sorry. <laughs> Suddenly I found out about punk rock. And I decided I was going to be a punk rocker, listen to obscure music, and dress differently, and go against the grain, and be opposed to everyone else. I was mad at the world. But one thing came out of it. That anger actually really powered my creative energy. Having a band <coughs> will be my excuse to create flyers, album covers, music, graffiti. I made my first website for my band with Dreamweaver back in 1999. Back then, it was with Macromedia, not Adobe and you would design everything with, with frames. It was kind of weird, it was pretty cool too. I was a webmaster. <laughs> but a very dark and emotional webmaster. <laughs> I started building this wall around me, this facade. It wasn't only about being independent, it was about keeping people away. My logic was if I let someone see who I really am, then this person would laugh at me just as my uncle did. Behind this mask, I was just sad, isolated kid. By the way, look at that. Donald Trump would be very happy. <laughs> Keeping that little Mexican behind a wall, <laughs> he will be good. Now, looking back, I feel I still have those two kids fighting inside me. One wants to assert his individuality and uniqueness, move fast, not care about what others think, and just do his own thing. And the other kid just wants to be liked and to be with other people, get their approval. He wants to belong. And I think as a creative, these two kids can be very powerful if they work together. We need both to belong to a team, to friends, family, love, and to be individual, having our own and original qualities. So we could, for example, use the, what makes us unique and in order to achieve recognition and belonging or collaborate with others and then put a touch of yourself in your work, something that sets you apart. I think the trick for these two little kids to work together is being kind to them. Both have their needs, their reasons to be, and they're both me. And I'm still that kid that seeks validation I'm still that other kid that wants freedom. So by being kind to them, I get to understand what they want, listen to their insecurities, know how to soothe their pain, and maybe just work it out together. Because we want to be part of something, belong, and at the same time, keep our individuality and uniqueness. So this story has helped me understand a bit better who I am and that to be able to grow, I need to acknowledge my flaws and be okay with them and be probably more vulnerable. And I invite you to open, open that vault and do the same. And well, regardless of what happens, whenever you need a boost, 
I have a challenge for you. Just stop what you're doing, don't mind who's watching, just press play and start dancing and know that you're not alone. On the other side of the world, I will be dancing with you and... Y'all ready for this? Thank you.